our time together. Many of you joining me this afternoon are very familiar with Conscious Discipline and some of you might be new. Conscious Discipline is a comprehensive program that addresses the social and emotional problems that we're facing today in our schools, with our children, with our families, and in our communities. The Conscious Discipline Pyramid, which you're going to see on the screen right now, there we go, Brian and I are working together, that you see on your screen will show how we address and resolve these problems. So we start at the bottom and we talk about a brain model. And basically what we're talking about is how stress unconsciously impacts our our perception and our behavior and once we understand how stress unconsciously impacts us then we need to step it up we need to go to the adults if something unconscious is driving us then we need as adults to become conscious of what is causing certain behaviors to show up at certain times so once we become conscious adults then we can create an environment whether it's a school family or whether it's a home family or whether it's a neighborhood that's based on connection because we don't have to defend ourselves against unconscious reactions we become more conscious in our responses so we so we uh, there's somebody on the phone. So what we do is we build a school family or a home family based on connection. That connection then gives us the willingness to solve problems and then we can use our skills to actually transform conflict from a life, uh, transform conflict into uh, life skills. So that's how we go about doing this. Today and in this series of seminars we're focusing on the seven powers for conscious adults and specifically today we're focusing on the power of perception. So and this is huge because our perception defines who we believe we are and what we believe the world is or how the world runs. So if you look at this this is basically what happens. How I perceive a situation dictates my emotional state, which dictates my behavior. And then my behavior supports my perception, and it goes around in a loop. So let me give you some examples. Now, this first one is quite funny. This came from Mandy Lloyd, and she was given a, a talk up at the National Association for the Education of Young Children and actually used this slide. And in this situation, she was sharing how she's sitting on a couch reading a story with her three-year-old child. And all of a sudden she looks up and she sees this spider. Well, her perception of the spider was uh, some kind of impending doom and death. So she does her screaming, jumps up, leaps over the back side of the couch, abandons actually her three-year-old child on the couch with the spider, screaming and shouting until her husband appeared. Now her husband comes out of the room. He perceives it differently. He doesn't see this uh, deathly spider that's going to kill her, kill him. He sees a spider. So what he does is just get a piece of paper, scoops the spider up, carries it, and puts it outside. So two very different behaviors. One, which actually Mandy abandoned her own child with this deathly thing, and the other one just pick it up and carry it outside. Let's look at another one. Okay, so let's take. You show up at work tomorrow morning, and this is your boss. Hmm. Okay, so now the perception is, oh my gosh, what's her problem? She's probably mad at me for calling in sick the other day. She found out I actually wasn't sick. Or your perception could be, she seems out of sorts. I hope she's not coming down with what I had. So those are two very different perceptions that would lead to two very different behaviors. One, if she thought she was coming down with something, you might wish her well. And if she thought she caught you lying, you're probably going to avoid her every time you see her in the hall and just turn your head the other way. Here's another one. Now this one is about a co-worker. This is not about the child. So here you are and you're, this child has spilt the milk again. And here's your first perception. Not again. I told Mrs. Jackie a hundred times to put a lid on that cup. I have to do everything around here. Coming back to if you want something done, do it right. Do it yourself. Or it could have been, oops, the milk spilled. Good thing we've got paper towels to clean it up. Either one of those dictates a different behavior. One, I'm very upset with Miss Jackie. 
I'm probably going to say things I regret and might take it out on this poor little boy right here who's just, oops, how did I get in the middle of all this? Here's another one, going back to your house. Okay, you come home, you see this in the sink. Your first thought might be, I'll give you a chance to have a first thought out there. How about that? Well, this probably going to, might be, would it kill him to put a dish in the dishwasher? Who does he think I am? A maid? Or you could have this perception. Wow, he must have been busy with the kids today. At least I know they ate well. So, again, each one of those give you a different internal experience. And each internal experience gives you a different behavioral response. One is more of a reaction. The other one is more of a response to the situation. Okay, take this one. You walk outside and here's what you see. Your first thought in your head, the first perceptual set of series of thoughts might be, these girls need to be expelled and punished. We don't tolerate that kind of behavior at our school. We have zero tolerance. Or someone else might see it differently. These girls need to be, oh, I read that one. It's on the other side now. How can we build more tolerance for differences, bringing all students together so each cares and supports one another? So again, two different perceptions, two different thought forms, two different internal states. One is an aggravation. The other one is more of a uh, how can I be of service uh, state. And then, of course, two different behaviors. And the last one, I'll just show you both at the same time. You've all been there if you work with young children. Uh, here we go again. That mother's going to blame me for this. Oh, my gosh, the paperwork, and that's going to leave a mark. Or... Boy, that, look how excited he is. I better get over there quickly because this could get out of hand. So basically, you've seen all these. i got to flip this, Brian. Put it back to me. Give it over here. Okay, there we go. So basically, I showed you different choices. You could perceive it one way or you could perceive it the other way. And here's the, the thing that you need to understand is you don't get that choice of how to perceive it unless you're conscious of how you are perceiving it. So if we keep running on automatic pilot and these perceptions, they happen so quick, they're like, like that, man. Those things just flap. And next thing you know, we've exhibited a behavior. And we think that it was the behavior that came first. It was the perception, the emotional upset, and then the behavior. So how do we get to this point where we have a choice of how we choose to see, see it as opposed to running on automatic or unconscious pilot? So we'll go back to the slideshow and you'll see. So if, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with conscious discipline, you've seen... Uh, the statement behind the power of perception. No one can make me angry without my permission. Now, again, I've said this often, that sounds really good on paper, but uh, in reality, it sure feels like situations or people are making me at, um, angry. I have a situation here at the office with the septic tank, and I'm telling you, I, I, um, I truly believe that the septic tank is out to get me. Now, I have to draw back from that because when I become in that unconscious state of thinking things outside me make me a certain way, then I become a victim to life and I lose my power of choice. So in conscious discipline, no one makes us angry without our permission, but something must be going on. So what is this something? Well, it's that perceptual programming we get. So if you think about it now, as we're born, what we have is um, our pre-programming that we get with DNA. So if, if, if I was a computer, in essence, I, I come with a pre-bundled set of software. And we all get the same pre-bundled set of software, which that, that's nice. We have a fight and flight system and all this other stuff that we come pre-bundled. Then we have some unique things that happen to us. We have healthy and unhealthy program that happens from our early childhood experiences. Some of the healthy ones are like uh, look both ways before you cross the street. Um, and that happens to some degree now automatically. You don't have to go to this unless you go to England and they're coming the other direction. But pretty much if you're just walking across the street, it's an automatic uh, unconscious 
nice little program that runs for us to keep us safe. But we also have very unhealthy perceptions that come from our childhood too. For example, I'll show you this. Okay, so let's take this situation. We get triggered, our buttons get pushed, we get upset. And what happens in our brain when we see a dog if we'd been bit when we were young? So if I've been bitten when I was a little girl, when I see the dog, I don't see a dog. I see that I see, experience, sense the dog biting me now and a whole different biochemistry happens to me, kind of like the spider story. However, if I didn't have that experience early in my life, I just see a dog. And so I might use my healthy programs like put my hand out, let them smell it first, and just check the dog out. But I don't freak out. So let me tell you a story about my life and how I got a very um, unhealthy program. Um, my dad was in the Secret Service and he did, um, he did the guarding of the presidents and all that, but he also did undercover work and get counterfeit money. And we were living down in Miami at this time, and so he got all this uh, counterfeit money that he confiscated on some undercover work he was doing. I didn't know all this. I probably was eight or nine years old. He brings it home, uh, un unaware to me, and puts it in the oven because he pulled it out of the ocean or a canal or some boat or something. Anyway, it was in the oven. Well, I'm getting up the next day. Uh, and, of course, my father's usually never home, and I didn't know he was home, but I was going to make a frozen pizza. So I preheated the oven to 350, which is said clearly on the box, preheat the oven to 350. So I did that. And uh, shortly after that, smoke is going everywhere, and the fire, uh, we didn't even have fire alarms back then. Smoke's going everywhere, and thing catches on fire. The money starts burning, wakes my dad up, which I didn't know was at the house. So he came out, and he was furious because this was evidence to a major case to bring down some heavy hitter, counterfeiter guy. Anyway, he was furious with me. Now, at that moment in his fury, I felt that there had been, that things were out of control and that I was in severe danger and I, it, 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 danger from a guy that I'm supposed to have a bond with. So there was a rupture in our bond. Now, I'm going to go back to the slideshow and show you what happens in that ruptured bond state when you feel the anger and outrage of an adult that appears scary for you. So we're going to go back. All right. So what happens in these times when we get an unhealthy program like if you want something done, do it yourself. Asking others uh, for help is a sign of weakness. When we get those, they come from these unhealthy programs that get stored on our disk. And they come from ruptures in adult-child bonds like the one I shared with you. Here's some pictures that kind of give you an idea. So what happens in those moments when this adult gets, in our mind, out of control? Well... As a child, we go, oh my gosh, something terrible. There's a terrible problem here. So our biochemistry, this is all happening unconsciously. We're going back to that brain model and kind of looking under the hood. So something terrible is happening here, which means as a, in brain language, everywhere. Also, the second step is I'm flawed. Something is inherently wrong with me. The next one is I don't fit in. I'm just... You know, I'm always this little odd duck. And the last one is, I am doomed to be on my own for the rest of my life, get kicked out of the tribe, kicked out of the family, and ultimately, if you go back into that uh, prepackaged bundle of DNA, if I get kicked out of the tribe, I'm going to be eaten by some woolly mammoth, so therefore I die. So then you make some very strong commitments, like to stay, stay, to stay safe, I must take care of things myself, uh, not trust others, all those kinds of unhealthy programs. In this case, with me and my and my dad, what I did was I decided to stay safe. It's best to stay out of the kitchen. Now, staying out of the kitchen, since you're eight years old, does not serve you well uh, because you never learned to cook. So, how does this affect my life now? Well, I'm I, I cook for survival means I'm not a good cook because I never was in there with my mother to learn how to cook. I chose to escape that completely. And 
now when I do cook, when I get in there by the oven or when I go near kitchen equipment, um, I get nervous. So we have Monday night dinner and people are coming over and I'm like, don't anybody talk. Be quiet. I've got to get these three things out all at the same time. And, to, and, and, and you would think, oh, well, isn't she a smart person with a Ph.D. and can't figure out how to get three things, corn, green beans, and chicken done at the same time? Well, not when you're in a state of, oh, my gosh, uh, this leftover program of what are you cooking now and how can you destroy life? Okay, so with that, then, I'm going to go back a little bit, back to the PowerPoint. Yep. You know, it's kind of funny talking to you guys like this because I always say, Are you understand what I mean? Are you getting it? And, you know, of course, you're out there, and I hope it makes sense to you. Okay, so how do we know when we fall into this unconscious state? So I don't want to be an unconscious adult, run on these programmed perceptions that may or may not be healthy. I want to have a choice about what my perceptions are. I want to choose a healthy perception so that I can respond to life's, um, what life brings. I don't want to be in this reactive mode of just being unconsciously driven by, uh, by my unconscious brain. So how do I know I've gone unconscious? Well, here's the science. You're swallowing or you get a tightening in your throat. You can feel your throat tighten up. You can get a tightening in your chest. You always hold your breath, which is why in Conscious Discipline, our first thing is be a star. If you'll do that with me right now, smile, take a deep breath, and exhale slowly. There you go. You experience a loss of energy. You're going to get tired. Your inability to focus. You start using humor or sarcasm. It'll come right out. And the biggest secret is you know in that unconscious state that you are right, everybody else is wrong, and you would lay your life on the line knowing how right you are of what other people have said and done and how wrong everybody else is. So, what are we going to do then? How are we going to get back and start being more of a conscious person because a lot of these perceptions we're carrying around are still unconscious to us. So how do we bring those unconscious perceptions up to our conscious awareness? Well, here's what you can do. So as soon as you have a situation where that be, you get become triggered, your brain will hijack you into the past, your mouth will open, you will act just like your mother, I would act just like my father, we would act just like the model we were presented that's been laid on that disc. And so that perception would take over, dictate our behavior. So what we can do, right when that's happening, catch yourself, and we've all, if you've been with conscious discipline, you know this, but we're going to catch ourselves, take a breath, and as that breath is taken, that pre-program is like a cloud will dissipate and behind that cloud if you're conscious enough mindful enough you will see your perceptual filter that you've been using and once you see it and become conscious of it then you have a choice to change it so I'm going to go back to the slideshow and show you this in kind of images and then I'm going to come back I'm going to skip a slide here real quick I'll come back to that one but watch this. So here's a guy. You should know better by now. One more word out of that trash mouth of yours and I will slap the crap out of you. That's what's coming out of his mouth right now towards a child. Now if he would take a moment right now, take a breath. I'm safe. Keep breathing. I can handle this. And take that little breath. That bubble that you're seeing on the screen, if we represent that as kind of a smoke screen, underneath that will be the perceptual filter. No one speaks to me like that. I deserve respect, you little brat. And you'll see up in that screen then would be the exact face of his father doing the same thing the generation before. So once you take that breath, it doesn't mean it all goes away. That just gives you the opportunity to see that 
program, unhealthy program perception behind it. And once we do that, then we have a choice to see that spider is out to kill us or that spider is going to go outside and spend the day with the lizards here in Florida. So back up. I'm going to take you right back here. Okay. So now how do we permanently change behavior? Okay. So Brian, if you'll put me back up. Okay. So how do we permanently change behavior? We must first change our perception. We must shift our perception. We must choose between a negative perception that spider is going to kill me and a positive perception that that spider is scared as, as scared as I am and you're going outside now. Or the perception that these girls who are kicking that boy and being a bully, they are horrible, mean, un crazy kids that need to be expelled and punished. In other words, we're going to take that problem and just put it on the street. Or we choose to see them as needing uh, to have healthier relationships. We need to bring everybody back in the fold and we need to learn some life skills of how to get along with each other. So our perception needs to change from negative to positive. The next thing is we must in this process change our emotional state. Whether we can change the perception first or the emotional state depends on, on you and the situation. So we go from upset to calm. So we must breathe. And then we must change our response to the behavior. Going from reacting da 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 to you've lost all the evidence in a case I've been working on for five years and the mob will take over Miami to responding. And I don't know how he could have responded any different in that situation, but I certainly can learn how to cook. Okay, so Brian, if you put me back on the uh, to the PowerPoint, there we go. So you can see this, what I just told you. So to permanently change behavior, not temporary, not a uh, let me give you a reward if you're good and a punishment if you're bad. Not just talking about uh, here's the consequence. You don't get to use the car keys if you stay out too late. I'm talking about permanent behavior change forever and forever. You have to change the emotional state, the perception, and your response to the situation. If we can do that, we can make huge changes in ourselves and, of course, huge changes in children. So we do this for children in conscious discipline. We would go, you seem angry, which is a, a helping them recognize that upset state. You wanted the marker instead of, you little heathen, why are you hitting your friends? So I'm changing their perception for them. I'm changing it from negative to positive. I'm changing their upset state to calm. Breathe with me. You can handle this. And then I'm going to give them the response. Tell them, I don't like it when you take my marker. Give it back to me. These are the same ways we teach children to change their behavior permanently and it's the same ways we teach them to teach others to change their behavior permanently. And this is why conscious discipline is so successful. So I'm going to go down here. I've got to skip these slides again because we've already seen them. I'm going to catch up with myself. So if you think about this, there's two basic principles to the power of perception. One, no one can make me angry without my permission. These are pre-programmed perceptions. And what I'm going to do is recognize them, acknowledge them, become conscious of them, and choose one that's more healthy for me. The other one is what we offer to others we strengthen in ourselves. So if we dislike others, a group of people. We hate this types of behavior. We hate it when we're treated like this. Our body no, does not know pronouns. Hate is a biochemistry. So if I'm hating you, I'm actually hating myself and I'm hating everyone because I get the biochemistry of hate which puts up a perceptual screen which dictates my behavior which will be, ha hate, will be hateful. <laughs> hateful and hurtful either way. Okay, so what we're doing then is when we, what we offer to others, we strengthen in ourselves. What we want to do is constantly offer a perception to others that's going to be helpful instead of hurtful. So I want to offer this to you. I'm going to see you in a positive light 
not just to let you off the hook by any means, but so that I can access the higher centers of my brain, so that I have the power of choice, so that I can behave in a helpful instead of a hurtful manner. So the power of perception, which is the first power of conscious discipline for conscious adults, gives us the opportunity to access the authentic skill of composure. And with that skill, we then can do the same process of permanent behavior changes for children. So I encourage you, I encourage you to let now be the time, let now be the time that we allow ourselves and each other to be good enough. So how we see a child, how we see a situation, or family defines the family, the child, and us. Our perceptions, whether, you're, whether it's a perception you're a bad boy, whether you constantly make mistakes, you're constantly critical, you can't handle life's events, we're constantly defining each other. So if we would access those pre-programmed unhealthy perceptions, choose to change them, we then get to choose whether we want to be worthy or not. And how we see a child dictates whether we will be helpful or hurtful to them and ourselves. And that gives us the opportunity to be deserving of love, to be deserving of helpfulness. So I think it's time, all of us. So uh, if we'll, yeah, I think it's time that we step up to the plate, so to speak. Step up to the plate and recognize that we are worthy and we are deserving. And the only way to do that is to get our minds around the power of perception. So until I see you again, or I actually don't see you at all, until you see me again, until our next time, which I believe is December 13th at 4.30, where we're going to continue on this journey. We're going to continue from the power of perception, which we talked about today, we're going to move on to the power of unity, that interconnectedness. So until next time, I hope you take something from today. I know I will. And apply it to myself. And use it so that we can be helpful instead of hurtful. So until next time, I wish you well.